Hello, friends. Trying something a little bit new. Never, never did this before. Um, I simply wetted the whole canvas with these big brushes with water before I did those um, water-soluble pastels. It's kind of pretty, isn't it? Dang, too bad that's not my style. You just <laughs> sign it, be done. 10,000 smackaroos. <laughs> How do they even do that with a clear conscience? I want to know. <laughs> you have to come up with a bunch of really, really, really big words about existential terror and the human condition and cosmic rays <laughs> to, to get people to buy art like this for a lot of money. <laughs> a lot of those artists that do that stuff, they really, they don't have any artistic skill. They do have socio-political marketing skill. <laughs> they can tell which way the wind is blowing and they know which, what kind of artwork to do. And, and some of them actually have um, literary skill <laughs> to come up with all that <laughs> crazy talk. Oh, boy. Anyway, hello. <laughs> Starting off on a positive note. <laughs> hello, my name is Dan. And as I'm assuming you saw by the title there, I've, I'm starting a painting. Um, I'm only going to broadcast the beginning of this painting. Let me turn you around and show you where I am. First of all, there's the, uh, I, should have, I should have looked up what river that is. It's an estuary. You can kind of tell that the ocean is over that way and over that way and over that way, just, just on the other side of that land. And here is the, uh, the tent where the reception is going to be tonight where Sarah and William are getting married. And there's the famous manor house, riverfront house, uh, designed by, let me zoom in a little bit for you here. No, you got a bunch of poles in the way. Uh, designed by the same man who designed the Lincoln Memorial. So Henry Bacon, I learned this earlier today. I couldn't have told you who designed the Lincoln Memorial. <laughs> His name was Henry Bacon. And he was building it for the Parsley family. <laughs> so I'm sorry. There's a little joke in there. So Mr. Hamburger lived next door. <laughs> and the lettuces had to move out. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, built in 1913. And a beautiful old house. And again, there's, there's some of the land and the reception. Beautiful tent. Beautiful tent. The band is going to be there. So tell you what, gang. I'm not even... I just... The, the, I already heard the band warming up. And they're loud. I will be wearing earplugs. <laughs> Hello. Input funny. <laughs> Hello, Michael McEwen. <laughs> Good to have you here. Um, so, if I probably won't even try to broadcast um, when the band starts playing. So, this hopefully this won't be too, too long of a broadcast because my minutes are numbered, or hours, it's actually, it'll be, it'll be a couple hours, an hour and a half at least before the band starts playing. So let me tell you what I'm doing. Um, I uh, went up the hill to the, to the beautiful historic house and took historic pictures <laughs> of the historic house. No, it took beautiful pictures of the of the historic house with lots of wonderful light effects and so on and so forth. I love painting architecture, as you may know, and uh, so I I love a background, a backdrop like this. So what's going to happen is this is a wedding painting, of course. Whoa! So I'm dropping <laughs> dropping paintbrushes. <laughs> so the bride and groom are going to be either here or here and the house is going to be behind them. I will take pictures of them doing their first dance later on this evening, right? And then I'll take hundreds of pictures because thankfully these newfangled phones of ours, that's one thing that they do really well. They take machine gun photographs. And uh, so 
So yes, I will literally take hundreds of pictures, sorry I just bumped you, of them and then take 25 minutes or so picking up hopefully the best one. So can you see my phone down here? Yeah, barely. So here's, here's my other phone that has the photograph on it that I will be working from. So here we go, drawing number one, yeah. Um, actually, I'm gonna do some yellow. I don't usually start with yellow, it's just too light, but I'll, I wanna do some really fast, big, bold, rough approximations, very rough approximations as to where I think this, this house is going to fall. nice big stately oak trees oh i didn't tell you guys where i am i'm sorry um i, I live in north carolina that's in america <laughs> and um i live in the capital raleigh north carolina in the middle of the state and i drove two hours today to come down to the coast of north carolina so i am just outside wilmington North Carolina so that's that's where I am Good. I kind of like that initial drawing in yellow now I, I will graduate immediately to orange which of course comes across as a darker color darker value so then the initial drawing that I did in in yellow essentially disappears. I don't mean literally disappears, of course, but essentially disappears because our eye locks in on the on the darker color. It ignores the lighter color. And as perhaps you can see, I'm already making a number of changes to my drawing. That's, that's a key concept for me. I've talked about it plenty of times, so I don't need to belabor the point here. The concept is just start drawing already. Just just start drawing and then make changes as you go along. Lots and lots and lots of changes. So all of this architecture, even as much as I love painting architecture, this is all just a backdrop perhaps we should say because the star the stars the star of this painting will be the bride and the groom of course will be a important supporting actor i have actually shortened this i think i'm going to make it go back up um here's a since i'm drawing it right that second here's a here's a tip you might if you haven't heard me say yet um, anytime you're drawing buildings, anything, but it, this happens a lot with buildings for me. Anytime you're drawing something and you want it to look like it's tall, like the cupola or whatever they call that lookout on the top of a of an old building, I want that to feel like it's high up, right? Then a good tip is to make, draw it uh, going off the top of the canvas. If you want it to look tall, make the canvas too short. It's so tall it goes off the top, off the top of the canvas. Get it? Kind of counterintuitive. Because most people would say if you want to paint the Empire State Building and you want it to look tall, then you, you do you paint the Empire State Building all the way to the top. And I would say, no, yep, good guess, but nope. If you want the Empire State Building to look like it's tall, it actually the, the the little pinnacle spire at the top actually goes off the top of the canvas, and then it looks taller, looks even taller than if you paint the whole thing. All right, so that's just another example of that here today. I don't know how many wedding paintings I've done. I've been saying 
lately. It's in the in the range of 300 or so. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I just, why did I say that? That's so strange. <laughs> no, no, no. 150. About 150. I started 10 or 12 years ago. I don't remember. I'd have to go back and look at my journals and see when I started. Um, had no idea at the time that it would turn into a major part of my career, but it certainly has certainly has done that. It, I, the first hundred paintings or so, uh, I finished every single one. That was kind of a, a point of pride, if you will. I mean, I hope not arrogant pride, but you know, it's like, yep, I finished them all during the reception. Um, and because and, I did, <laughs> and uh, but then something happened. Actually, I, I have a pretty good hunch what it was. But um, my the number one thing that happened is um, I started doing much more realistic and tight and accurate portraits of the bride and groom. So that changed everything when I started doing portraits, of course. Years ago, the first hundred paintings, my, I was much more impressionistic with the bride. You could see some, some of these still on my website, either at Danielson Art or WeddingPainter.com. Um, you can still see some of my early ones uh, identifiable mostly simply by the fact that they are the bride and groom are more impressionistic. Still capturing the likeness and not at all cartoony. That's the, that's a real danger. Hey, let me give you a tip. If you're doing human figures in your painting, but it's not a, it is not a figurative painting. It's, you know, bodies at the beach or, you know what I mean? People, figures is what I'm trying to say. Um, here's a general rule of thumb. Even as I'm about to say it, I think, oh wait, my friend Nicole Kennedy violates this rule very well. But anyway, here's the general rule of thumb anyway. Uh, it is, um, don't do, don't attempt facial features. Um, again, I'm talking about, uh, you're doing a landscape, you're doing a path through the woods, and so let's say, for instance, and you want to, to you want to paint in, two people walking toward you on the path, right? So their body is, you know, their whole figure is five inches tall, maybe. Generally speaking, then, in that kind of situation, you do not want to do eyes, nose, ears, mouth, okay? Generally speaking. And I, I think if you want to see my example of this, just go to any of my wedding paintings Excuse me, I'm going to sneeze, I'm afraid. The only thing worse than sneezing is feeling like you have to and then not. <laughs> I'm not sure that's the only thing worse, but anyway. <laughs> you know. Um, anyway, yeah, look at my wedding paintings. And the bride and groom, of course, are portraits. So their faces are <laughs> finished. But pretty much everybody else in the painting has minimal features or no features. And... There's a range there, but generally speaking, the rule should be: uh -uh, don't if you're doing. Hello. <laughs> I was telling Peggy that you're gonna paint the bride and groom dancing. I am indeed. I love yeah. that. Good. Thank you. How did you come up with that idea? Oh, <laughs> you mean doing wedding paintings? Yes. A dozen years ago? Oh. I don't know. <laughs> Somebody suggested that. I thought, what a great idea. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, you do have the, hello Monique, you do have the giggles today. That's fun, love it. Thanks for giggling at my, on my broadcast. <laughs> All right, next step, here, let me see if I can show this picture to you, I'm gonna try. Let's see, see if you can see this. Oh, barely. You're just getting more glare than anything, aren't you? Yeah, sorry. Just glare. <laughs> That's what I thought. 
anyway, that's my my reference. By the way, some someone, some artist might say, well, wouldn't it be better, like if you used an iPad so that it could be bigger? And here's here's a here's a funny. It seems funny to me. Here's a funny surprise. The answer is an emphatic no. Um, and this is particularly true, I, I feel, when you're doing uh, portraits where, you know, catching, capturing similitude is of paramount importance. Um, contrary to what we would think, the smallness, if I can misuse the language in that manner, the smallness of the screen actually works in our favor. Isn't that funny? You would, again, one would think, oh, bigger screen, you can see everything better. And the answer is, yes, you can see everything better. And that's what, that's what messes you up. Um, now, of course, and again, especially with an Android, forgive me, I don't know how well you can see this, but I can zoom in like to a ridiculous degree on, on it. So I can see details, that, that's no problem. The thing is, when we artists are doing, trying to capture a realistic image, in this case, I'm trying to capture a house built in 1913, by the way, so not, not terribly old. It's not a antebellum, A-N-T-E, antebellum mansion. This is only 108 years old. Um, so, but when you're trying to capture realistic, and again, the, the most extreme form of this would be when you're doing portraits, which I will be doing later this evening. Um, the smallness of the screen actually works in your favor because it, it, it's not the details that you need. That the details are easy, and this applies to portraiture especially. Um, the hard part, and for those of you who've perhaps never done or tried to do a portrait, let me tip you off. Let's, let's get you off on a head start. Let's say you're doing a portrait of Mabel. <laughs> There's lots of Mabels running around. It is indeed. Oh, Thank my you. gosh. <laughs> I love uh, your job. <laughs> Thank you. So um, you, you've, you've got a photograph of, of Mabel, or, or you're working from life, which is even more cool. Um, Capturing Mabel's nose, pretty much piece of cake, easy, relatively speaking. Capturing Mabel's mouth, easy. Eyes, easy, relatively speaking. <laughs> I'm messing with you here a little bit, okay? All those things are easy, right? Because they're fairly small and compact. What's hard about portraits? Oh my goodness, let me tell you, that's easy. That's an easy answer. What's hard? The answer is getting the nose, eyes, mouth, ears, hair, all in the proper location, relationship with each other. It's the big stuff that's hard, not the small stuff. Same thing capturing a house like this. It's the big shapes that are challenging to capture accurately, not the little things. You know, catching this railing right here, piece of cake. This window, nothing to it. This pillar, do it in my sleep. What's hard? Not as hard as portraits, of course, but what's hard? Getting them all in proper relationship to each other. Therefore, seeing the image on a small screen is a, dis a distinct advantage over seeing the image on a big screen because the, small the smallness of the screen, again, letting me abuse the language, the smallness of the screen makes seeing uh, relative uh, sizes, ratios, much easier. So there you go. Three cheers for painting from a phone. And while I'm at it, just for what it's worth, until recently, and I, I don't know, I've, um, I'm an artist, so therefore I'm a Macintosh, Apple Macintosh guy, have been for 30 years, right? Um, but when 
when the cell phone thing started getting serious 20 years ago, whatever it was, um, maybe not that long ago, when, the, when cell phones, smartphones started getting really serious for some reason, and I'm not complaining at all, but my wife went out and bought us uh, Android phones instead of iPhones. Um, it didn't bother me one way or the other. I didn't have an opinion, but I have developed an opinion since then because it turns out that was serendipitous or providential, whichever you like to say. <laughs> because for years, the, the Android phones were way ahead of the iPhone. And I'm a, you know, I'm kind of an Apple Mac fan, you know, I'm an artist, blah, so, you know, figure. But um, for some reason, uh, and I could just, just explain to you why they were way better. And maybe they've caught up now with the iPhone 17 and a half. <laughs> I don't know for sure. <laughs> I don't know what number we're at either. <laughs> iPhone 9, iPhone 11. <laughs> anyway, so enough about... The point is painting from a small screen better than painting from a big one so no put that iPad down put your iPad down if you if you want to get it now if you're just a crack if you're a real good artist like my friend um, Doug Strickland who used to paint from his computer monitor all the gorgeous stuff look him up Doug Strickland um, he painted from his computer all the time and and yes but Yes, but you need to understand Doug Strickland is a freaking genius, okay, at drawing. So, I mean, I'm not bad, but he's, he's, he's just crazy, okay? So he can draw from whatever he wants to because he doesn't need any support or help. So I'm, I'm talking here about those of us who, you know, our drawing skills benefit from, from this principle. All right, enough said. Whew, that was a long lecture wasn't it three cheers for small screens yeah that's the title of that <laughs> you know what i should do one of my jobs in this season is i write i write blogs art blogs for i'm on the board i got talked into i'm kidding you i'm perfectly okay belly up belly to the bar <laughs> and do my part to serve humanity um so i'm on the board of a local arts organization, Fine Arts League of Cary, and uh, one of my responsibilities that I signed up for is uh, writing a blog every week. Whoa, I just reminded, I missed this week, doggone it, <laughs> I'm glad I said that. All of a sudden I just realized, wait a minute, I didn't do this week's blog, oh boy, okay, I'll do two next week. And anyway, that I just realized, oh, you know what, three cheers for small screens would be a good, would be a good topic for a blog. I enjoy writing, and one of the things I am enjoying about this new, my new lifestyle, my new season in life, is that um, it has opened up the, the possibility of uh, doing more writing again. For many years, when I was a crazy full-time artist, which is where most of you guys found me in that season, um, my writing had way taken a back seat. Uh, so I'm enjoying I. I, anyway, I got several books in the works. <laughs> We're taking bets as to which one of them will ever see the light of day. Which ones of them? But some, some, one of them will. <laughs> some of them will. All right. Now, glazed time. Woohoo! Isn't this fun? It is fun. I love it. One of the ways. And again, of course, you all know this, but I say it anyway. You don't need to paint like me, right? Nobody needs to paint like anybody. In fact, nobody can paint like anybody. As much as I might admire Richard Schmid, which I do, I can't paint like him. I mean, I, you know, I could stick up my tongue and painstakingly copy stroke for stroke, you know, and that's okay sometimes. But anyway, um, Paint like yourself. I, there's, I was going to make a point. Here it is. You know you're getting close to your true calling. Use that kind of scary 
language, you know you're getting close to your, your true uh, calling way to paint. Because there's a, every, as you, I'm assuming you know, there's a bazillion different ways to paint. <laughs> At least a bazillion, right? Probably, probably two bazillion. <laughs> you know you're getting close when you just flat enjoy these steps, the the processes, the processes of your painting. You know you're getting close when, ooh, you know what, this is kind of fun. Ooh, next layer, that's kind of fun too. Ooh, and that's that is certainly describes me. And I hope all of you can keep painting till you till you find a technique where at every turning point you go, ooh, I love this part. And that's pretty much the way I feel. I'm always evolving, as you regulars will attest to. I'm always changing, I'm always experimenting slightly. But generally speaking, I really enjoy the way I paint. I like the way it looks. It makes me makes me happy. Like I'm enjoying this right now. I enjoy this uh, great big broad uh, orange brushes, glazes, transparent glazes. I mean, all all glazes are transparent. I hope you know that. But I just threw that in there for those of you who are maybe slightly confused. Now, what's a glaze again? From, I'm assuming it's related to the word for glass in Latin, but don't quote me on that. Go look it up. Is the word glaze really, is it the Latin word for glass? I don't know. All right, now give me just a minute. I certainly need to clean these brushes. <laughs> I haven't said this very often. One of the downsides about painting with two hands <laughs> you know, I'm not going to quit, but one of the downsides is you have twice as many, twice as many brushes to clean all the time because I never, I never dirty just one brush at a time. I'm always dirtying two brushes at a time. <laughs> so, strange uh, downside. All right, I'm going to use evidently one long-handled brush, just like this. I, I want two brushes about about this big. Now, to do, again, <laughs> one step of the process that I really love is this one right here. All right, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, this is time for me to start thinking about bride and groom here. Nope, here, pretty obvious to me. Okay, so I'm just going to make some wild and crazy marks. Uh, by the way, the the angle that I almost always do on these wedding paintings, and, and I'm going to essentially do a, a portrait of the bride and groom, is um, it's a low angle. That is to say, I hold my camera, which is a phone in this case, of course, when I'm shooting them during their first dance, I'll be holding my phone about chest high, sternum high, shooting up at their faces. Um, pretty much always do that because that's a, that's the hero, that's a, a heroic angle, if you will, right? People look good uh, looking up at them. Um, you know, think of like a painting of Napoleon on his horse, right? We're looking up at Napoleon. Oh, a god and not a man, you know? <laughs> so, so uh, if I have my wits about me, which I usually do, <laughs> um, when I'm taking a picture of this house, I have to be careful. I, I can't just go click, click, click. I have to hold the um, the camera at the same angle that I'm going to hold the camera uh, when I do the bride and groom. Otherwise, of course, that we'll have we will have major um, perspective issues. Most people wouldn't be able to tell 
what's wrong with perspective, but some people might say something's wrong with that angle. So indeed, happily, I, I remembered that today when I was shooting the house. Actually, what happened is I took a couple pictures, not thinking the, the wrong way, and thank goodness, snapped into reality, snapped into you know, awareness pretty quick. It said, oh, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. I know I've done, as I said, I've done hundreds of weddings. I should know better. But anyway, this is a, a tip that might help some of you, not just in your wedding paintings, but paintings of any kind. If, you, if, if you're doing a, a painting where there are going to be people in your painting, but you're painting from, this is, I, I would think, not all that uncommon. You're taking a picture of the south rim of the Grand Canyon, just saying, for instance, but you want to put people, tourists, or your grandchildren, or your beautiful bride, or whatever, in s standing in front of the lookout over the south rim of the Grand Canyon. Then you have to make sure that the two photographs are, in a sense, that the camera is held at the same angle for both photographs. Boy, I hope that was. Hope that made sense. Um, the first dance there I'm gonna have some challenges here pretty pretty standard wedding painting challenges but um, the first dance right now right now it's 530 the ceremony is starting any minute it's, the ceremony is about 200 yards from here up the hill lovely underneath a, one of these giant oak trees by the way with with a lots of Spanish moss and I'm gonna have to add the Spanish moss because I don't see it in your photograph I hope I remember to do that it's definitely part of the panache part of the atmosphere part of the feel of the southern manor house plantation whatever um, so the ceremony is at 5.30, that'll be done in 20, 25 minutes, of course, and then it's cocktail hour for probably an hour. So the fact is the first dance probably won't happen for an hour and a half or two hours yet. And think about it. <laughs> I invite you to think about it. Um, the light, the sun, will be much lower in the sky by the time 7 or 7.30 gets here, right? And yet I'm already painting a, a view of this house with about 4.30 or 5 o'clock lighting on it, right? That's a challenge. That's a problem. Um, it's basically you just have to think about it ahead of time and you have to plan. You have to make plans. And so I did think about it, and my, my decision was because, and I could be wrong, it could be that this house is going to get way better lighting, very possible, at 7.30. Of course, I don't have time to wait, right? There's one issue. Sure, I could wait until the light is, you know, wait an hour and a half and take a picture, but then I, I'm way behind the eight ball because I'm going to spend most of the reception finishing this and and painting the bride and groom. Um, but when I was up there 45 minutes ago or so, um, there was one key element that was really, really, really sweet, and that was, and I know you can't see my photograph, but there was shade from this tree hitting this wall right here. This is just a blank wall, which by the way is not all that fetching, attractive, beautiful, interesting, just a blank wall no window in it or anything no architectural elements but the shade the the dappled sunlight same thing over here dappled sunlight throughout so i decided to go with the dappled sunlight feel i am going to consciously uh try to make the light lower than it is in my photograph and the first dance the bride and groom are actually again i'll turn you around just for a second they're they're going to be standing you know, in under this tent, so the sun will not be shining on them. And um, so, anyway, I'm I'm certainly hoping. <laughs>
here's what I'm thinking, and I've thought this far ahead too. I think, I think in this painting, they're actually going to be in twilight evening lighting. The house, which is behind them, I'm going to try to give the impression that it's catching like the last rays of the sun before it dips below the horizon. So that they will not be in sun. Clearly, during the first dance, my photographs, they will not be in sun. Uh, so they're going to have a magical, especially the bride, going to have a magical glow about her in spite of that. A little bit of fiction. Can, we, can I call it that? Yeah, typical art, artist liberties kind of fiction that people are pretty accustomed, expecting to see really in a, in a wedding painting. Anyway, those are all my thoughts thus far uh, with regard to sun, lighting, atmosphere, and so forth. It's, it's uh, to some extent, it's a, like doing, uh, it's like a little bit like plein air painting in, in that regard right now. You, you must not, when you're doing plein air painting, that means outdoors, on location, set up your easel. This is a little bit like that, but the, you must not chase the sun. While you, while you are out there painting, the sun's moving throughout the sky. So if you're out there for two hours, the sun's going to move an awful lot. And, and one of the first lessons I think every plein air painter learns is, whoops, <laughs> don't follow the sun, don't chase the sun, don't keep changing. So the rule is, and I've talked about this a lot when I'm doing plein air painting, when you first show up, decide either, bingo, what I'm seeing right now is the best the lighting's going to be, in which case then you take a picture with a camera or with your mind, right? And uh, both, of course, you take a picture with your mind and you try often if you take a picture with a camera. Or you might say when you're doing plein air painting, you show up, you unfold your easel, it's four o'clock in the afternoon you go, hmm, well this is pretty nice, but you know what, I bet you in about an hour and a half or two hours is I can see the sun's going down that away. The light, the shadows are going to be much more interesting, blah, blah, blah. In which case you start painting, predicting what you think the light is going to be in two or three hours. And that takes, of course, that's, that's a lot more difficult than painting what you see is painting what you think you're going to see. And then if in fact you stay out that long and paint for the rest of the evening, then when the, when the when the uh, magic hour arrives, you're going to find out how close you were. <laughs> and of course, as a plein air painter, you, you get better at predicting lighting. Now, the way the father of plein air painting, Claude Monet, the way he did this, he took out a whole stack of fairly large canvases, three by four, four by four feet, and he would paint on one canvas for 15 minutes. Then put it aside, paint another one. He'd have a whole stack of canvases and paint 15 minutes, you know, from 4 to 4.15, from 4.15 to 4.30, from 4.30 to 4.45, blah, 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 and mark each canvas. And then he would come back the next day, assuming the weather is similar, of course, and do the same thing. Canvas number one, 15 minutes, number two, another three. So at the end of several days, he would have several plein air paintings, one from 4 o'clock, one from 4.15, one from 4.30, not I'm not sure it was 15 minute increments, you understand, but that is the idea anyway. Nowadays, um, since I'm talking about plein air painting, um, almost all plein air painters paint really small, like as, as small as four by five inches, or eight by 10 or 10 by 12, you know, even, even 16 by 20 is considered large for m many plein air painters. Um, as I joked years ago, when I started plein air painting, which was 2004, I mean, I'd heard about it, of course, but before that time, I'd been an illustrator mostly. Anyway, so when I started plein air painting, <laughs> I missed that instruction. The day that they, the day they told us that we were supposed to paint small, I must have been absent that day. <laughs> So I came right out of the chute as a plein air painter six, 17 years ago, painting huge, uh, 30, 36 by four. I went through a number of years 
early on where 36 by 48 was my standard plein air painting size. And to support that, I, I had a huge uh, plein air easel that I modified and built and so on. And still have those. Don't use it as nearly as much as I used to, obviously. <sighs> All right. What now, shall we say? Aha, I know. Back to drawing with small brushes, dark details. Whoops, sorry, you got bumped there. Some of you guys are chatting up a storm. <laughs> Thank you, Art Rich Studio. I appreciate it, you know. <laughs> Someday my ship will come in. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, oh, so I was going to show some of you newcomers. So here are my acrylic paints. Um, they are, they are I, I buy already fluid acrylics, not, not acrylics in the tube. So they're already lower, um, lower pigment content than like a tube of, a tube of paint. And then I add to that about 50% uh, medium. This is one of my often used mediums, Liquitex, gloss medium and varnish. GAC, golden, GAC, GAC 100 is probably my very favorite uh, acrylic medium, but pff, I'm not very fussy really, they're all just fine. All right, hang on just a second, let me think. I'm going to draw, yeah, a little red. Um, so uh, th this, these little pots here are approximately 50% paint and 50% um, medium. So there, it's transparent. That is the key, the key issue, the key element. Um, long story, funny story. I won't tell it all here, but I, when I was in art college, when I was an art major in college in the mid 70s, um, acrylics were pretty new. And most of my professors were abstract expressionists. It was a, I'm sorry to say, I've ragged on them many times over the years. Not bragged, ragged. Um, it was a weak art department. It was a great school, weak, weak art department. I didn't know it. I didn't know any better. I was a kid, you know, I was a student. I didn't realize. And one of the weaknesses, here's a, here's a great description of a weak art department. Are you ready? It's real easy. It's real simple. By the way, I don't recommend any gifted student go and major in art. None. Enough. They want to do art education. That's different. Yes, yes. You may major in art in university, but if you're a gifted artist, absolutely do not go to college or university and major in art. If you have anybody in that situation, you feel free to send me a private message and ask me why, and ask me what. But I don't want to get into it right now. But anyway, um, here's a description of a bad or weak or lousy art department. It is. All the professors, there's too much uniformity among the professors. They agree too much. That is a bad art department. Like if they're all contemporary painters, it is a piss poor, lousy art department. If they're all hyper realist, ditto. It's a lousy art department. If they're all abstract expressionists, you get the idea, all right? So that's the way, unfortunately, this college. They weren't all the same, but they were way too similar. There were, and there was not one real realist in the bunch. There should be at least one. That, that, by the way, that should be another. There should be at least one realist. And, uh, and many art departments are none. Um, anyway, why was I telling you this? Something about... <laughs> I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> I <laughs> shouldn't have gone so far down that rabbit hole. <laughs> oh, it'll come back to me, I promise. Anyway, just a moment there to rag on my good old alma mater, I guess. <laughs> Are you familiar with that expression, rag, rag on something? That means to say bad things about them. Uh, and I've, I, since I've gone this far, I'll 
say I, every once in a while I begin to think maybe I should you know maybe I should cut him a break maybe I shouldn't be so mean you know to my old art professors most of whom have gone to their rest <laughs> so to speak to use 19th century language um, moved on to their eternal reward <laughs> um, here's here's another Here's another description of a bad art department. There you go. I could start a whole, I could write a whole blog on what, what are the markers of a bad art department. Number one, all the professors are great. Number two, um, the professors are arrogant. And that's, that's a really hard one. First of all, because it describes most professors in every field of human endeavor. Sad to say. Um, Many times, professors are not good teachers. They're not good teachers because you don't have to have a teaching degree, right, to teach. You just have to have a master's in art or a PhD in other fields, whether you're a good teacher or not. And that's a, that's a questionable system in my book. Anyway. And, uh, yeah, most unfortunate, most unfortunate. And I feel like that has nothing to do with her being a professor. That has to do with character issues that should have gotten slapped out of them long before they became professors. Um, I have taught young people, uh, many of them not terribly gifted, talented. Some, a few, exquisitely talented. And but even so, I treat each one with authentic respect, acknowledging they could easily grow up to become whatever, better than me. And it's not like it's a competition, you understand, but you know what I mean? Anyway, and that is, I did not receive that. Um, <laughs> that's an understatement. <laughs> Here's a story. <laughs> I went, I finished my senior year. I, I, I started my art major as a junior, so I had a rather late start. I started out as a music major, by the way. And uh, changed schools, changed majors, changed everything in my junior year. So I didn't finish by the end of my senior year. So I went home and, and uh, spent a whole delightful summer at home. I was 22 years old, you know, finished my senior year. Before I went back and, and took out a semester, a summer and fall. And uh, when I came back to the art department, in, the Jan in January for my last semester. <laughs> the, the, the lead guy in the department, he wasn't officially the department chair, but he was the heavyweight. Everybody knew who was really, whose opinion really mattered and it's his. His name was Chris. We'll just leave it at that. I think he was essentially a good person, but boy, I caught him in a bad, weak moment. <laughs> second or third day of the semester he saw me walking down the hall I'd been gone you see for seven months a summer or summer in a fall been gone for six or seven months when he saw me <laughs> he rolled his eyes he was so unhappy to see me back <laughs> he was so unhappy to see me back in his art department. <laughs> is that funny? <laughs> I mean, it's sad. That is, that is just flat sad. That is some bad juju right there. That is some bad character issues. And I don't think he's a bad man, but boy, I caught him in a bad moment. A bad season of his life. <laughs> he did not like me or my art very much. I was just, I was a, I was a pain. I was this kid who insisted on doing representational painting and would not get in, just refused to get in on the abstract expressionist bandwagon. And um, <laughs> oh my goodness, isn't that funny? Am I a better painter than he was? 
I'm trying not to cuss. <laughs> Heck yes. Are you kidding? I'm now older than he was, considerably older than he was at the time. And he was a decent painter. He was. Hats off to him. Anyway, enough of that. <laughs> Just life's funny, isn't it? All right, I'm done drawing in blue, I think. <laughs> I'm going to do another uh, glaze layer. Um, when I teach, when I have students imitate, follow my, my technique, um, this is, well, back the one stage, the white is a, is a, students often get confused. Um, when we do this white, because they, they don't realize, they don't quite picture that we're going to do another glaze on top of this. What we just made white, it's not going to stay white. We're going to... Uh, do glazes on top of it and whatever color we want um, input funny did I answer your question no he wasn't jealous he was irritated as I said irritated that I, I wouldn't get all excited about abstract expressionism and modern art if I can just use that expression in the broad sense of the word. Now, part of the irony, of course, is if you follow me at all, I mean, one of the things I do, it's certainly not my the core of my career, but one of the things I do is abstract painting. I love abstract painting, non-objective. So not even abstract, uh, not even abstract, not expressionism, it's abstract, abstract, Beautyism and I, anyway, I think they would approve. By the way, I did by the by the time that semester was over, I did graduate uh, with honors from from the department. So they they repented to some degree. They were by the time I came along, the the school had the art department had changed its mind, and it was no longer giving per, granting purchase awards to every. To every at every art graduating class right so before that they had been giving you know the art department would buy uh, graduating seniors not every senior but many anyway and they had discontinued that uh, but I think there were 30 art majors graduating with me and they did in fact buy one of my me and one other student the other guy was very good, and he was abstract expressionist. <laughs> I took a detour. I mean, I, you know, no, my art education was not good for me, really, at all. But <laughs> I did manage to get out alive. <laughs> Let's talk about something else, shall we? <laughs> I shouldn't have gotten onto that subject. And... I know, I'm not telling you where I went to school, but, you know, you can figure it out by doing some research. Good school, truly good school, just not a good art department. And I think the same is, I think the same is true of that school to this very day. I think, but not my job. <laughs> not my job to worry about it much. Okay, let me see where I'm going now. Oh, that, wait, wait, I put those brushes away prematurely. I had to wash them anyway, I guess, didn't I? Now let's do some slightly smaller. Um, next, um, I'm going to do some some glazes in blue. I did. I just did yellow orange glaze, as you see there, and uh, didn't do any blue. So I've got to going to do that now. A combination of phthalo and ultramarine. So just about a straight up perfect mid-tone blue, cobalt blue. Yes, that's why I don't, well, I don't want to use cobalts because I'm not sure, I just don't know about the long-term health effects, health effects, health effects. <laughs> By all means, avoid health defects. Um, and I'm not, I'm not the kind of person that's all skittish and worried and scared about all kinds of stuff like that. I just, I just, meh, it's not, I don't, but, you know, reasonable. 
and I don't need cobalt blue because I find that the combination of ultramarine and phthalo blue in the right proportion can recreate, reproduce just about perfectly a cobalt blue. In fact, one time I did that with some students in a class. I mixed up ultramarine and phthalo and put down a stroke of cobalt and said, can you tell which is which? And they could not. So that was somewhat gratifying. Next, um, I think I'm going to draw again, I think, with pencils. I could, I could draw with paint, but the last drawing layer I did was blue paint. Before that I did red drawing, as you can see. I'm going to do a white glaze, I mean, not white is not glaze, I'm going to do opaque white here in a minute, but I'm wondering if I might do... Yeah, I think I will. I'm just in the mood as I look at it. Purely intuitive decision. I'm in the mood to do um, some more uh, pencil. People say to me all the time, they're amazed that I paint in a tux. Of course, I'm in half a tux at the moment. My jacket is hiding under a table over there. Um, they say, Mitt, don't you get paint on it? And the answer is yes, heck yes, constantly. So I can get about, I don't know, four or five, six weddings out of one tux before I have to. I've gone through 20 tuxes in the last 10 years. Um, I have ways of covering up the paint, but after a while my cover-up becomes so thick. <laughs> Looks like I have sequins on my jacket. <laughs> yes, he was a big fan of Picasso. Yes, they were all gaga over Picasso. Yes, indeed. I, we're talking about my art professors here. All right. Now, once again, there's going to be a bride and groom here, and I don't know where. I don't know if it's bride and groom. Bride and groom I don't know. I'm just going to make some messy marks there. Um, oh, yeah, and there will, I will probably put some people over here, some other people standing nearby. They, they will all be, you know, thumbprint kind of people like I talked about. No, no, facial, no facial features, a line across the brow, up across the eyebrow, eye, a horizontal line at the most, usually to indicate the, the hint of features. But that's usually about all. Okay, the good news is this, this house, this famous, the place, beautiful place where they have chosen to have their wedding is already um, uh, plenty um, rendered enough. It, it's, ac it's accurate enough that uh, essentially nobody would look at it and say, that ain't right. <laughs> No, even though there are, there are little inaccuracies that don't much matter. It certainly does, it looks like this place is close enough. So now, most of what I'm doing, and even with the pencil, I'm, with the pencil, I'm much more concerned with texture than I am similitude or realism. I'm more concerned about just making interesting marks even though as you as you know certainly the the, uh, the the pencil lines do in fact help you know drawing with capturing the image but that's not my primary concern my primary concern is simply the texture itself the feel that the pencils are making. I don't know exactly, I should have, well, I'll get to it here in a minute. Now I'm clearly in need of, well, let, let me do just a little bit. I'm clearly in need of 
indicating some figures like this with most of my f distant figures not not the bride and groom most of my distant figures in my paintings start out uh, as monochromatic dark blobs that's pretty pretty standard for me um, ever since I started my fine arts oil painting career which which was recent actually is 2004 I understand that's fairly recent in my life someone my age <laughs> Uh, again, for those of you who are new, that does not mean, I, no, 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 I did not start painting in 2004. I, I became, essentially, to go, I became a professional freelance illustrator in 1972. <laughs> age 18, at the ripe old age of 18. If by professional you mean it was my job while I was in college different college, by the way, than the one I've been describing. And, uh, you know, I designed, I was graphic designer slash illustrator. That was a great way to start. Anyway, so I was a full-time artist and, and illustrator for decades before I picked up my first oil painting tube. Get it? Anyway, um, my, I've, I've, I've been, throughout the course of my fine arts oil painting career, I've done lots of live event painting at festivals and so forth so you know when did i start wedding painting well only 12 years ago but for years before that i was painting at festivals so i i got quite a bit of practice of painting um crowds of people because i'm at a festival thousands of people going by so i got and i was just going to say that i for many years i actually left my figures my fairly abstract uh, figures in the crowd, um, almost like silhouettes. You can st still see some of that. Um, I don't like those anymore. I did it for a number of years. Now I, that was one of those. That was one of those growth uh, changes that made me not really not care that much for all my old stuff. So uh, my, but the, my painting, my figures still start out like this as silhouettes and I add light and color to them uh, later in the process all right I think that's enough um, enough pencil now I'm going to do one more layer of white and then I might take a break um, because um, I and I would end the broadcast at that point. And if I can start it, another one, I certainly will. Thank you for your company so far today. Um, oh, I hear some applause. So evidently, the ceremony has come to an end. I, I sense a you may kiss your bride moment has just happened. And... Um, Anyway, I have to do the bride and groom in acrylics. I can't, I can't, of course, save them for the oil stage. <laughs> that would be, that would be a mess. So I'll, as soon as I f finish her, if I, if sooner if I feel like it, as soon as I finish this uh, final white layer, I'll end this broadcast. Once again, my formula is. Um, oh, I remember what I was, how I, why I got started talking about. Yeah, okay. So in, <laughs> let me finish the sentence. Um, <laughs> um, in my acrylics, all of my, all the colors are transparent, and the white is opaque. Of course, many times I apply the opaque white in in a thin manner, so is it is more technically speaking it's actually um, translucent all right I was telling you I started to talk about college days because in the early mid 70s acrylics were fairly new that's right this is what I was gonna mention and I just fell down a rabbit hole and my professors being mostly gaga 
about abstract expressionism. Well, I don't know if you know this or not, but acrylic paints are like an abstract expressionist's best friend. I mean, it just fits the <laughs> angry. <laughs> okay, I know they're not all angry, but you know, if Willem de Kooning could have painted acrylics, he'd have been a lot happier. That's all I'm going to say about that. So all my professors were gaga over acrylics, and they pushed us quite, quite a bit toward a painting acrylics. Again, because they were abstract expressionists, so why wouldn't you paint with acrylics? Duh. And uh, the, the result in my case is I, I turned into a confirmed acrylic hater. <laughs> Say that really fast. It's acrylic hater. Acrylic hater. I'm acrylic hater. I was a confirmed acrylic hater for decades. Uh, just just don't like the way they anything about them. But about the turn of the millennium, 20 some years ago, um, long story, I won't give you the whole story, but I accidentally stumbled on the magic of transparent acrylics. That changed everything. So I went, overnight, I went from an acrylic hater to, ooh, unless they're transparent, then I'm an acrylic lover. And uh, that's a big part has been this, that has been the, one of the most consistent elements in my fine arts, oil painting, plein air painting career since uh, 2004 has been virtually always start out uh, with layers and layers and layers of transparent acrylic. And I still, I still like the effect. It still, it still has me captive. I still love the way it looks and feels. So, do, so don't you wish everybody did kind of thing. You know, I think everybody should paint this way. I'm being facetious now, but you get the point. All right, I think um, I have rambled on more than long enough. <laughs> That's why I don't have very many subs, by the way. I think it's the main reason anyway. It's just, most people don't have the patience. They see a, a YouTube video that lasts two hours and they go, thank you very much. No. Anyway, but we have a small community of wonderful friends that have been hanging out for three or four years. And uh, I'm not making any money, at, much money at it, but I'm having fun. So in my book, that's, that's pretty good trade-off. All right, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it quits, end there, and uh, I'll come back if I am able. I'm not sure that I will be able to, because when the band cranks up, then they're playing copyrighted music, plus it's deafeningly loud. And um, so this might be the end for the day, but it has been great fun. Thank you for hanging out. Thanks for your chats. And... Oh, input, funny, what inspires, now, you, you haven't been watching me very much because I have an answer, like, what inspires you? The answer is my mortgage, my friend, paying my bills, that's what inspires me. <laughs> I know that's not what you mean. Uh, there's a degree of truth there, though, because I don't, I don't sit around and wait to be inspired. I paint because I have to pay the bills. Um, <laughs> for, forgive me for that, a little bit of smart aleckness. Um, that's a good question, I don't know the answer. Um, I never run out of ideas of things to paint. Uh, if I'm not doing a, a plein air, uh, sorry, if I'm not doing a wedding painting, then most of the time, at least in the, over the last 17 years or so, I have uh, plein air painting has been my has been my bread and butter, my my stock and trade. That's what I do. I'm a plein air painter. Um, so that's my inspiration, if you will. Although there is a chance, I am considering. Um, because now I, I, I forgive me, the story's too long to get into it. Just six, seven, six months ago, my life changed, and I am no longer dependent uh, exclusively on my artwork, or primarily on my artwork to pay the bills. So that frees me up, and that's part of the reason I haven't been painting so much because I've been doing other stuff. I'm now a, about as much a musician as I am an artist, and and uh, shortly to be as much a musician and a writer as I am an artist. So in my inner, from my point of view, I'm coming back into balance with my authentic person. For many years, I was happily out of balance, being a crazy, hardworking artist. But now the stars have shifted, and I get to be uh, the true Dan Nelson, which is a combination of art, music, and writing. 
And I'm thinking about doing some, uh, for want of a better term, I'll call it fantasy painting. Figurative painting would be another. All right. Thanks, y'all. Thank you, Mr. Um, Input Funny, <laughs> for your great questions today. I appreciate it very much. Good to have you on board. Please come back anytime. All right, that's it. I'm going to paint for all these people that are descending upon me shortly.